Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Garasimovich, a PhD student in Russian lit. This week, coming to you live from my new apartment, mm. uh, where I saw a spider while moving in. So, uh, probably the, the last time I'll be coming to you live <laughs> in this apartment. <laughs> And I'm Cameron Lalana. This week at my local co-op, there is a sale in sardines, and I've never felt more ashamed of the checkout line, including Monday nights when I'm buying liquor. I bought a lot of sardines, if that wasn't clear. A lot. How many sardines? How many? Uh, I cleared out an entire section of of one brand of sardines. Got a boy. Well, this is a podcast, not exactly about sardines, but where me and my good pal Cameron <laughs> get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about something significantly less fun than adultery or farming techniques, like in our Summer of Anna Karenina uh, series. Instead, we're going to be talking about World War II. In the unwomanly face of war, Svetlana Alexeyevich covers the wide experiences of women on and off the front lines during the Great Patriotic War. If you're interested in helping out the show, take a look at patreon.com slash tipsy Tolstoy. We have a lot of fun Patreon-only content and rewards, and it really helps the show out. If you're not interested in Patreon, but would prefer to support us in a more, well, free way, uh, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website. Yes, thank you for the updates, but before we get into the reading today, Matt, what are you drinking? So um I'm, I'm I'm throwing us off off the off the game here because I'm I'm doing a sober soul need since tonight, Cameron, and I'll tell you mm-hmm. why. Okay. And that's that's because I spent the whole weekend moving and I have sweat every ounce of water out of my body <laughs> and my body craves just water. And I think if I add alcohol to the mixture, I I, I could just die. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I can't argue with yeah. that. Well, it's a good thing I'm making up for us then. That's good. What do you got? So I actually I have two things. Now, first of all, I have uh, a small bottle of sake, uh, Shochiku Bai Premium Ginjo Sake, because uh, this is a very sad book we're covering. Really, really sad. Uh, so I'm going to do a shot every time I feel sad. And because I don't want to die, <laughs> I got a relatively low ABV drink like sake. So there's that. And my, my official drink of the night is a Delirium Tremens from the family brewery Huig. Huig. H-U-I-G-H-E. I don't know. Belgian. Belgian. <laughs> the country. Words. Pronunciations. Belgian people tell me what this means. Yeah. Um, it's a Belgian ale, if that wasn't clear enough. Um, recently, a, a friend of Matt, uh, Matt and me sent me a message, and it was, Hey, Cameron, how many Kazakh guys do you know? And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Secondarily, one. Uh, and he said, um, he's, in a, he's in a master's program for philosophy at uh, in a small European country, and he said, hey, "I've got like a one random Kazakh guy in my group, which has one friend in common, and I think it's you." And I realized that it was somehow this one random guy that I'd met and made friends with in Petersburg, who was who was somehow gone several several states away to join the same small philosophy program as our friend. I, I feel like that just about sums up mutual friends with Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this one's for you, unnamed friend from from Petersburg. Uh, this is one of his favorite beers. So. Cheers. All right. Pour it out. Well, pour it into your mouth. I will be. <laughs> I am. So let's talk about World War II. Um, or actually, <laughs> let's, Matt, let's start with who Svetlana Alexeyevich is, because she's an absolute G. Just incredible she woman. She really is. Yeah, she is. So Svetlana Alexeyevich is a Belarusian journalist, and you probably, uh, well, if you're interested in Russia things, you perhaps have seen the HBO series Chernobyl, which was actually based off of her oral history of Chernobyl. That's her genre that she does a lot of is she goes around and collects oral histories from underrepresented groups in various periods of time. Like today, we're talking about World War II and we're talking about women on the front lines, which is something that was largely written out of official history during, uh, well, after the war. And so she does a really cool thing where she kind of takes together all of these fragments and she pieces it into not necessarily a narrative, but she she pieces them together and it is super interesting. So she's done that with a, a couple things. World War II, like I said, uh, Chernobyl, Soviet war in Afghanistan and a couple other things. And in 2015, she won the Nobel Prize in Literature. So if you've heard of a, a Russian writer recently, there's like a fairly good chance it was her. Yes. So that's Svetlana Alexeyevich. And I'm going to come in and talk about a little history stuff. Do it. 
drop it. <laughs> I don't want to go too into the history element, although I could go on for a long time. Uh, but I just want to say some things that if you're really immersed in Russian history, this may be pretty basic to you. And you may be like, uh, Cameron, yeah, I know. Isn't this obvious? But I don't think it is obvious what I'm going to say, because I was raised in like a World War II kind of household. And that's weird to say, but I was allowed to watch like three channels growing up. And one of them was the History Channel. And that was basically at that point just like the World War II channel. So I grew up like memorizing documentaries about World War II. Like I watched them over and over again until I could like recite battle lines from memory. Um, you know, <laughs> love that kind of media. And of course, as Americans, we're inundated in World War II media from video games to books to movies. We love the stories of the Battle of the Bulge, of uh, just endless amounts of talking about D-Day. And, you know, I think it's interesting still. But... Of course, if you are only consuming American media, you might get the idea that the war was primarily won on the back of the U.S. And it's hard to understate the role the U.S. did play in World War II, especially in terms of our manufacturing. But in terms of just day-to-day -day combat, that's not exactly true. And I'm not going to get into talking about battle lines and casualty statistics and all that because that's exactly what Svetlana Alexeyevich is trying to get away from and I'm going to respect that that wish by not getting into that in this podcast but just if you are not familiar the war in Europe was mostly fought on the eastern front world war ii we estimate roughly although we'll never truly know that between 60 and 70 million people died the USSR lost between 26 and 27 million people a vast vast majority of that number it's hard to understate the number uh, of people in Eastern Europe that died to the, to the Wehrmacht. Conversely, the German army, the Wehrmacht, the SS, suffered three quarters, three fourths of their wartime losses fighting the Red Army. So just even just based on those basic numbers, you can infer that a great deal of the war happened on the Eastern Front. And again, I, I'm, I don't want to get too into it because it's, it goes really far, but it's very easy to, to misunderstand that from the at least Western context. I mean, that's something that I kind of thought all my life until I was in college and studying World War II formally and sitting down and being like, wow, that's wild. That's something you really don't get from American media, which is, you know, only fair. But, you know, roughly, and this is an estimate that I read on the Washington Post, roughly 60% of, of Soviet households lost someone. And it is hard to understate the place that World War II or the Great Patriotic War still plays in well, various uh, Eastern European countries today. You know, in America, you're, you're raised, you probably see all kinds of movies all the time, but it's really living history in Eastern countries. Uh, I'm reminded more than anything, when Matt and I were in the city of Yaroslavl, we went to go see a, an elementary school to teach some English there. And when we entered the, the lobby... Well, what we did, defining it as teaching is broad. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> we talked at some children about English language. <laughs> technically and they the entire lobby at the, the check-in was one entire world war ii exhibit the whole wall was covered with the photos of family members of students who had died in the war there was a, a <laughs> there was a replica submachine gun in a well i hope it was a replica there was a submachine gun maybe real maybe a replica in a case <laughs> in the corner um and that was just like one of two sections of that building which are just memorials to world war ii every year there's a parade in moscow of course but there's also people who bring remembrances of, of family members who died in the war it is hard hard to overstate the effect that world war ii had on like day-to-day -day eastern european life it was devastating there were there was just an entire just places in eastern europe which just nothing existed anymore and I, i'm i'm taking a line uh, from an Eisenhower memoir where he writes, When we flew into Russia in 1945, I did not see a house standing between the western borders of the country and the area around Moscow. Through this overrun region, Marshal Zhukov told me, so many numbers of women, children, and old men had been killed that the Russian government would never be able to estimate the total. It was all-encompassing, and it's very easy to miss that if you're only consuming western media about the, about the war. So this is just an incredible piece what we're about to get into, not only because it's there's so much history that if you're not, if you are interested in World War II and you are not getting into that, there's so much history here that you're missing. I mean, especially that the fact that she's writing from the perspective of women who even within this 
even considering this this massive element that's already missing, you have a subsect of that, the the experience of women in war, which is a huge portion of them, which has also been left out of even people who are familiar with that, or just day-to-day Eastern European perspectives on the war. So this is just an incredible piece of literature on on that. And also, okay, side note, totally different thing. <laughs> I just want to point out that if you're interested in World War II, highly recommend that you just read literature that's not just about like battle lines and statistics. Read about social stuff. Read Stud Circles, The Good War, which is basically the same thing in the U.S. Read Race and Power in the Pacific. Just read outside the usual stuff that everyone likes to read just because it's frankly more interesting and you know other stories have been told a lot of times so you know investigate something new that's just my soapbox what if i don't like to read cameron well what if i just want to watch history channel documentaries (laughs) (laughs) well then we can talk about the battle lines in iwo jima because i still remember a lot of that of course (laughs) that's how i learned my first japanese wow yeah the more you know (laughs) yeah yeah thank you history channel teaching me baka (laughs) word of great import in my life Mm -hmm, mm-hmm mm-hmm Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a random uh, like fun fact about you that I didn't know, but really <laughs> checks out, you know. Like. <laughs> so World War Two. World War Two. I was kind of curious because um, I have read this or part of this before for class. So I was kind of curious for you on, on your first read through, especially as someone who's worked in journalism and whatnot, how you felt about this sort of approach to storytelling because like i mentioned it's a lot of kind of piecing together other people's stories yeah i mean i love it personally one of my favorite american journalists is stud sterkel who is basically an american svetlana alexeyevich he he goes around he takes the topic and he just interviews people and as i already mentioned he's got the book the good war which is basically the same well similar concept he just interviews people soldiers civilians factory workers women men every type of person and he does that for other concepts too, working, the con- what people do or think about their jobs, about race, et cetera, the Great Depression. And he's absolutely one of my favorite journalists because there is so much of, I don't want to go off into like my feelings about journalism, but there's this tendency <laughs> to take one lens or one person's life and use that as a perspective into the entirety of an event. And while that mm-hmm. is a good storytelling t- technique and it's really able to hold a lot of, it's able to hold a lot of interest. The upside of taking this kind of fragmented sort of storytelling is that you have a great deal of variety of perspectives. And that really comes through in this book because you have some people who are still to this day carry so much hatred in their hearts. Understandably, I mean, when you are are, are reading about people, especially the partisans who, wow, they had a rough time of it, who were coming across their, their country, men and women being staked, being cut up, being burned alive, or... Uh, women who are nurses who, you know, were specially targeted and were finding, like, if they were any of their comrades who were captured, they would find them with their genitals mutilated and, and staked and burned. Uh, a lot of lot of staking and burning. Mm-hmm. It's uneven, easy to understand hatred, but you also have other people coming in who, who don't see that. And notice when they when they see the invaders, they're not seeing, like, a, a, you know, a faceless horde, but they see the young men who are fighting this and, and barely more than boys. And some of them, to this day, can't carry hatred for them. And some nurses just want to kill them. Other nurses sneak them food, the prisoners, and will stop Soviet guards from hitting any prisoners. So, I mean, that's just like one particular instance or one particular kind of topic, which I noticed carried through this book, this place of hatred or humanity kind of struggling between them. And if you were just reading one person, you'd just get one thing. You'd get hatred or you'd get some kind of love or kindness. In, in Maybe you could have that in turns in a person, but this clashing of viewpoint, the fact that these are contradictory viewpoints i think brings a lot of value to this kind of storytelling just because you were able to tell the complexity of human experience through it yeah i think it's it's an important type of genre for trying to capture something that's so big like we've been trying to Mm -hmm. you know we we can say it's it's big and it's important but it's hard to really get a grasp of it until you've kind of read i feel like some of these stories not even just for what the contrast bring out but also just the amount of them like there are so many and i this is just for my own personal thing just trying to imagine the amount of effort that went into writing a, a book like this like this must be significantly pruned down from what the interviews she had received were like these i'm sure were not quick interviews in a lot of cases these were just long these are like lots of people tons of travel uh, and I, I can't even imagine what is left over from this book there is 
I mean, I would imagine enough to write another book. Yeah, probably several. <laughs> I, sometimes yeah. she'll mention she'll have go between chapters, which are just fragments, maybe a paragraph or two long to a whole chapter, which is about one person or two people. Mm -hmm. And that's only like maybe 10, 15 pages long. And she'll mention that this was originally like a three day interview. I can't even imagine how much she had to cut out of that to create this narrative that she has yeah. before us. Yeah. I kind of do wonder about it just on the, the topic of genre before we talk about it. I, I feel like there, there are two sides to it. There's one side of, well, two sides to people who, who dislike her approach. One of them being uh, what she did wasn't that hard. She just talked to a bunch of people and then she put it in a book. Uh, and then the other side kind of being that, not that she herself is dishonest per se, but that the act of actually pruning down all of these narratives and putting them into her own narrative, it, it takes away maybe some of the objectivity of it, perhaps, or it maybe raises into question what she's doing w with the narrative. Mm. It doesn't really matter to me personally. Uh, I brought it up because I thought it's a very interesting question on the topic of genre, but it doesn't take away from like how important I think the book is. Yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, okay, so when I was in college, I worked in journalism. So this is kind of a, a passionate subject for me. But just I'm going to take it in, say it as short as possible. <laughs> the idea of objective journalism is nothing more than fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. Objectivity, as we recognize it today, is a set of principles that most organizations tend to follow. But it's a set of principles. It's not always been the same. It's something that evolves over time. Every single story you approach, it has a whole world of facts. It has an unlimited number of facts and you've got 500 to 1500 words to capture a story <laughs> you have to cut things out you have to make choices and the, the question is how do how do you create the most complete story in that 500 1500 2000 word story there is always going to be a bias based on that individual writer or based on the culture of the organization well frankly that's how <laughs> things work people individual biases come into writing in, in terms of what we choose and what we don't choose to put in it will never be perfect. And it's up to us as critical consumers to really think hard about what we're consuming. Well put. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was just, I was finding a quote that was related to that ish. Oh boy, I have too many things underlined. <laughs> well, while I'm looking for this quote, I was just curious, did yeah. you enjoy the, the, the book? Because I... Oh, yeah, so much. I had a feeling that it would combine two of your interests. <laughs> this is like, I, it's been enraptured. Every chance I've had in the last couple of days to just read, I've been sitting down and reading this. The only thing that has distracted me from reading this really is reading Anna Karenina. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I like ooh, when I had to read this for class. I didn't have a lot of time to read it, and I had I read like half the book in like a day, and I oh boy did I have to decompress afterwards because <laughs> it's whew. it's interesting. It makes you want to keep reading, but it, it's one that like. Oh, it's a t it's a tough read. It's a tough read. Um, I the I almost wish that uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich had editorialized more because her opener is just I I love her opener so much. They're like I was underlining just left and right lines mm -hmm. from the opening before she even got into telling stories. Um, especially her her justification for why write about women specifically, as if you need a justification for a topic which is just systematically underrepresented. But she writes at one point, everything we know about war, we know with a, a man's voice. We are all captives of men's notions and men's sense of war, men's words. Women are silent. No one but me has ever questioned my grandmother. It's just, I mean, it plays into specific things she's talking about. Even these women who fought in this war are often forgotten or... You know, mm -hmm. when they go to parades, they don't wear their decorations. And that's something that's true, not only in, well, now Russia, many other places in Eastern Europe, but any, I mean, I used to study civil wars and anytime you f see any civil war where women are, are a significant portion, shame almost always follows that some element of shame, which is put upon these women who fight and step out of like traditional gender roles. And so I could just go on and just go through every single page and read a line I like a lot, <laughs> but just really... Just enjoy her as a writer, even outside of her work, too. Yeah, I, I, I do like her writing. I, I definitely intend to read more of her, her writing, for sure. After reading this, I was like, wow, I love this this genre. I find it just very fascinating. And she has this this line, I, I found it. It's talking about kind of her theory and philosophy on putting it together. Somewhere in the middle, it's on page 141 of the copy that I'm reading from. Uh, and it says... Uh, however much I love to look at the sky or the sea, still I'm more fascinated by a grain of sand under a microscope. 
the world in a single drop, the great and incredible life I discover in it. How can I call the small small and the great great when both are so boundless? I've long ceased to distinguish between them. For me, one human being is so much. There's everything in him. You can get lost. And for me, well, first of all, there's just so much to unpack. But I think, like you were saying earlier, that this it gets to the core of what Alexeyevich is trying to do, which is get away from quantification of death. Because at the end of the day, a death is still a death. And that's what she's trying to re kind of bring back just into the discourse about war, I think, and well, life more generally, I guess. Uh, and, and usually I think when you talk about World War II, you're just so accustomed to having numbers thrown at you that they almost mean nothing. Like, you know that <laughs> that's a lot of people that died. That's a big number. But it doesn't feel the same as hearing that number uh, versus reading these individual stories. Right. That's my soapbox. I think it's absolutely right. I mean, it's one thing to be quoted at you like, okay, America had 420,000 casualties. France had casualties. Again, I was raised in the American context. <laughs> right? <laughs> the Soviet Union had such and such casualties. Um, but it's an, quite another thing to read. And I, I was there's one story which really, I mean, they all really, really fascinated me. But she interviews two sisters, uh, daughters of a relatively famous uh, Soviet commander of of military uh, factions across not only in the civil war but also in the civil war in spain etc cetera, etc cetera. and one of the one of the women she interviews she's a nurse and one of the most striking things to me is that for years and years after the war she avoided markets because the first time she went after the war she went to go sell some shoes she had and all she saw were veterans of the war men who had lost limbs, men who were just not able to function in everyday life, who were there just trying to sell things. And, and she felt bad about saving life during the war because she was so afraid that she would run into someone that she knew and have them look into her eyes and ask her why she saved his life when this is what he has to do when he's on the street now just trying to hawk just whatever he can get his hands on just to make a buck. And she doesn't go for years and years. And it's one thing to say, such and such number of people die but it's another thing to sit there and think about a you know not going somewhere for years and years because you're afraid you you've saved a life and what if that life went on to be worse after this war or b the lives who were there in that in that market who who fought the great patriotic war and have now been left abandoned more or less to live in veterans homes selling things in the street i mean one's a number the other is life and one is so much harder to grapple with and I'm taking my first shot of sake because I've just made myself really, really sad. <laughs> yeah. See, I don't want to draw the the through line, but just for me, Alexeyevich's approach, it, it reminds me of the moral complexity of Tolstoy and a very similar approach of going like in depth into one person's mind. The idea that, you know, you really need to understand the the individual for me, a lot of the editorializing of Alexeyevich reminded me of, of Tolstoy. And that could just be because we're also doing Anna Karenina right now. But it seemed like it potentially would have been an influence on her. I mean, you know, who doesn't Tolstoy influence? But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 good kind of an influence to have because it, it challenges even if you don't fully buy her editorializing, which you don't have to. I think it's interesting because, OK, so. At least in the media I grew up in, there is very much a sense that what what drove the USSR on? It was fear. In, in World War II, it was fear that the commissars would shoot you in the back if you took a single step back after, you know, Stalin introduced the order that if you ran, you would be shot. And that's a relatively easy through line to, to follow. That's a relatively easy kind of story to follow. And I'm not saying that never played a part in it, but I, I think you see complexity in the, in the stories of of fear and and what exactly it wrought because okay so there's one story of one woman in here who was a nurse and one night she they're under bombardment and she just begins to drag people into a shell hole anyone who's injured she she drags into a shell hole and she begins to treat them down there and they're holding line and then two soldiers on the line panic and they run and then everyone else panics as well and runs with them and of course she's with the rest of them she runs and she she with everyone else and the next day they, they fight their way back to that point and they found that everyone in that shell hole has been killed they've been executed where they where they lay 
and she feels such chills that saving these men led them to be in one easy little pit to be executed by the Wehrmacht when it comes time for the the two men who ran to be to be sentenced and they're sentenced to death of course this is after the the decree that if you you run your shot she volunteers she steps forward and she volunteers when no one else will they're all kind of in this kind of fear because of course they all are also ran but it's only the two that broke first who were charged she steps forward and shoots them both and she sits back and thinks what i did that today i don't know maybe maybe i would i think about it a lot it's a hard choice for me but I mean, that's something where you can understand them. And of course, in the, in the story itself, it also talks about their reactions as well. But the, the, the complexity of the individual in, you know, how do, we, how, do we prevent, how do we prevent losing, you know, wounded who are, who are stuck where they are? And, you know, what do we do with, with people who run, break and run? And, and it, it just brings such human complexity into this moment where it's relatively easy to play Call of Duty 2 and see, you know, Commissar stating at boats shooting anyone who even thinks about not running right into gunfire. Um, <laughs> you know, one's a human story, another's, another's a narrative, I guess. I feel like in, in America, there's also the perception that people were forced to fight in the war. At least maybe that's the perception that I had had when I was younger. Uh, but the, I mean, a lot of these stories deal with women doing things like lying to go to the front like lying about their age or like stowing away in the train that they know is going to the front not because they want to fight necessarily but just because they want to do something productive to help protect their kind of their motherland and i i was really curious i i don't know i don't want to make a blanket statement about about the book because it probably mentions it at some point but a lot of the the women when Alexevich is compiling these stories from from what I recall, they don't really mention kind of these large scale historical figures like we think of in World War II. They're not thinking about ideology. They're not thinking, hey, you know what? I want to go fight Hitler. That's not really what their their driving purpose is. It's this kind of profound sense of not just not just like patriotism because that kind of like simplifies it, but just like <laughs> this is where I've grown up. I'm gonna go out there and make sure no one else comes to it and destroys it. And that's just a really basic human element that it's all built on, I think. Yeah, that's something I loved in this novel, the, the reasons that people go to fight. Mm -hmm. You have what I would call the obvious ones, such as some of the women in the book are, are, for example, Jewish, and they lived in Eastern European states, which were first captured by, by the Nazis before they even went to the Russian Republic of the USSR. And, you know, for they, for example, would have their families murdered. Not in front of them, but they would have their families murdered, and then they'd run and they'd survive. And of course, they had nothing to do. They had no choice but to join the partisans. The people who were still alive in those villages wouldn't speak to them because, you know, associating with any with any Jewish people it means also death. So you've got some people who have no other choice but to join the war. And then there are other people who, it almost sounds like a novel, the way they joined the war. One woman, she's I think she's from Siberia. She just starts giving a lot of blood. That's what she. That's her contribution to the war. She gives so much blood every month. They give her a bunch of food. She gets more rations than everyone else, and then she begins to write her address on on the blood she gives at the behest of the doctors. And one guy comes to visit her, and they have a grand old time. They're having a great time. And a month later, she gets a note that this person who has received her blood has died. And then she kind of sits there and is like, "My blood was spilled on the front lines, so I have to avenge that." And she sneaks to the front lines to start fighting the Wehrmacht yeah. based on her idea of my blood's been spilled I need to avenge it based on this this man I didn't really know and it's like such a wide variety of tough visceral like you had no other choice to kind of almost like this is something I'd expect from like a very from like a mid-tier novel writer for why you go fight in a war kind of stuff yeah some of them are almost unbelievable but that's in part what I think makes it so special is just the fact that you would never think that this is this would have been a cause, perhaps. Um, but it's just smashed in the absolute gritty realism of the story. Yeah. If there's anything that captured me, it, I mean, a lot of things captured me about this book. It was the story of, I forget her name, I wish I knew it now, uh, the women who served as medics in the in the tank battalions because they were, they had mm -hmm. a rough time of it. I mean, tanks are not built to carry medics, <laughs> but they carried medics with them, which meant the medics these women had to just stand on the back which you may recognize as 
an absolutely terrible place to be on a big giant thing rolling through a battlefield being shot at. And of course, when tanks caught on fire, it was their job to start pulling these guys out of small hatches from things that were on fire. And I I, I can't even imagine being their position. They would mention that like, oh, we were like tiny because everyone's small. There's no food. Um, Like tiny hundred hundred pound kids. They were barely more than teenagers pulling, you know, 150, 200 pound men and their guns because of course they need the, the guns are really, really important at this point. So she's like, one of the women is like, in, in, over the course of my career, I probably saved, they tallied up, I saved, you know, almost 500 men, an entire re- regiment. And she's like, I don't know how I did that, frankly. I don't know how I carried hundreds of pounds at a time, you know, pulling them out of burning tanks while I was being shot at. It, it's hard to think about now. I mean, I can't imagine doing that. That's wild. It's just, it captures the imagination, the absolute limits that people can push themselves to in, in the right situations mm-hmm. or wrong situations as as that case probably could more aptly be described yeah i can hardly carry groceries up my stairs <laughs> i can't like i literally cannot imagine some of these things um but i want to i want to throw you a maybe it's a softball question it, it, for, for me i just i want to hear about why you think alexievich decided to name this the unwomanly face of war uh, of course it's about women but she could have just named it women in world war ii or something mm, like that right i mean <laughs> I guess that is one of the major elements of the book is kind of talking about the idea of femininity. And she's not, you know, writing like a Simone de Beauvoir criticism of the, the notion <laughs> of femininity. But she is talking about like the different faces of, of I guess, women, in which in this case for her is synonymous with femininity and what that means in, in the context of warfare from one element of like what 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 is it to be to grow up? someone who is identified as a woman and then be sent to something which people identify as a man's thing and on one level you have the obvious sexism they face the just like day-to-day comforts of there's one woman who i think alexievich asks her what he what she feared the most day-to-day and she says oh you probably expect me to say death but no it was men's underpants it was every day <laughs> we didn't they didn't have any men, women's underpants so they just issued us men's underpants and you can't imagine how ridiculous we looked and at the end of the war, when they finally were giving us women's underpants and, and, and bras, we were like showing them off to each other. We were so proud to have that kind of underwear back. Or the perception of them was fundamentally altered by the people around them by participating in the war, for better or for worse. I mean, there's just so many ways that the notion of femininity is challenged by, uh, by an action, which is at least, I would say in this culture, but frankly, in, in most cultures, is considered a, a manly thing, which kind of is interesting not a main feature of the book but an underlying thing that that's continually i guess addressed or even not addressed yeah i found that a lot of the book had to do with kind of that that suppression of their femininity either intentionally or just not knowing or i don't know there were like a lot of aspects to it of course the the one that i was gonna point out too was that the uniforms just like not having uniforms that fit um bras underwear even shoes a lot of women were talking about how you know they were wearing like these really heavy boots that were meant for like people would like double their feet size and just like thinking about being in combat trying to do that with things that don't fit and like are not designed for you uh really limiting (laughs) yeah that not helpful for sure yeah it kind of makes me think of i think it was one of the the two sisters who were the, the the daughters of the famous Soviet military commander who one of them talks about putting on a dress at the end of the war. And this is the first dress she's seen in years. And she like kind of standing in the mirror and she feels both kind of proud. She's like, oh, this is a lovely dress. But also like she's been wearing trousers for years and years. And it's just strange for it not to be a just practical thing. Mm-hmm. And, and that sort of alienation from what she herself feels proud of is an interesting thing to approach. There's also just the, the the aspect of the physical wear and tear of war, mm. just the malnutrition, the stress, uh, the, the everything that comes along with it. Uh, I mean, multiple women talking about, and I really, I don't think this is hyperbole. I think they're really being serious talking about like w- within not that much time, all of a sudden they have gray hair, uh, things like that uh, going along with just you know, not having food, not really being able to, um, you know, <laughs> stay healthy. Being shot at, finding your friends tortured to death, you know, things right. that will drive your hair gray. Things like that. Yeah, I know it sounds probably like self-explanatory, but I think it's it, 
really interesting and puts it in perspective for us as young people uh, when some of the people that are being interviewed are talking about like, oh, I have grandchildren who are my, who were my age uh, when I fought in the war. And I look at them now and I think like, wow, I was that age when I was doing all of this stuff, uh, which is fascinating because <laughs> a lot of those people's, uh, you know, grandchildren are probably, you know, a little younger than us, but around our age, which is, as I mentioned, the groceries are still a stumbling <laughs> block for me. So yeah, after like a year and a half in, of COVID stress, I'm going like I've, I've developed an unfortunate number of gray hairs. So actually being mm-hmm. in a real stressful situation, wild mm-hmm. <laughs> compared to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would probably go gray overnight too. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any particular stories that really struck you? There, there were a lot of ones that struck me, but thinking on the topic of the unwomanly face of war, there were a couple ones that were just really harrowing reading. Uh, the, this is one woman talking about right after she was decorated uh, with the medal for courage. Uh, she had her first period and thought that she was shot. And one of the older man soldiers, she says, explained it to her like a father. And there's just so much contrast between like women in in certain regiments were treated fine and people would look after them and, you know, explain things to them and whatnot. Uh, But then there are also instances of like sexual assault in other ones and just really uh, terrible things, even, you know, of course, within the regiments. So I first of all, interested in contrasting experiences, of course, but also just the kind of almost suppression of biological functions throughout war, which Mm. of course you might think, yeah, of course people, you know, have to do things like that during war, but it's just, you don't like to read it. You really don't. Yeah. I mean, speaking of biological functions in that very same story, at one point she's so tired after she's unwounded, a truck full of wounded that she sleeps in the truck. And upon waking up, she runs to the political commissar and tells him, commissar, I'm I'm ashamed. I fell asleep in the truck. And he's like, where? And she points it out to him, and he's like, eh, good for you, honestly. At least one of us can stay awake now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very opposite our view of political commissars and their role in yes. these battalions. Yes. But, you know, it, it it runs the gamut from just soul-suckingly sad to funny, weirdly. I mean, it kind <laughs> of... The, the one story that I keep thinking back to, just because it is unexpectedly funny, is this one by a, a pilot... Uh, from the uh, lieutenant of the guards. And there was so much that was funny. Discipline, regulations, insignia. We didn't master all of this wisdom at once. We were standing guard by the plane. And the regulations say that if anyone comes, we should stop him. Halt! Who goes there? My friend saw the regimental commander and shouted, Halt! Who goes there? Excuse me, but I'm gonna shoot. Imagine, she shouted, Excuse me, but I'm gonna shoot. (laughs) <laughs> excuse me <laughs> which is just such a I, I can't even describe that that's just, just something that has a kind of, sort of power or resonance with me of just in this war people who are fighting and dying and especially people who are not raised in, in or, or frankly fully trained so they don't have a, a proper idea of military discipline so they're just they're just fighting a war <laughs> so they're mm-hmm. still like kind of civilian politeness excuse me but I'm gonna shoot is still <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, that's what I think was so interesting. Really, is when you're looking at individual stories, you see how just ordinary people dealt with horrific situations. It's not trained soldiers in a military that had been, you know, working on combat situations for years. It was like just anybody who could help, and it really helps put that into into context. Yeah, I don't have too much more that I wanted to say, but there was one section that that does uh, of many sections that stick out to me that i i wanted to read just to give everyone listening a kind of idea of the sort of story you'd be reading getting into this so um it's sad so first of all bottoms up (laughs) sad Uh, bottoms up kampai we left for the front at the age of 18 or 20 and came back at 20 or 24 first there was joy but then fear What were we going to do in our civilian life? There was fear of peaceful life. My girlfriends had managed to finish various institutes, but 
What about us? Unfit for anything, without any professions. All we knew was war. All we could do was war. I wanted to get rid of the war as quickly as possible. I hastily remade my uniform coat into a regular coat. I changed the buttons, sold the tarpaulin boots at the market, and bought myself a pair of shoes. When I put on a dress for the first time, I flooded myself with tears. I didn't recognize myself in the mirror. We had spent four years in trousers. There was no one I could tell that I had been wounded, that I had a concussion. Try telling it, and who will give you a job then? Who will marry you? We were silent as fish. We never acknowledged to anybody that we had been at the front. We just kept in touch among ourselves, wrote letters. It was later that they began to honor us, 30 years later, to invite us to meetings. But back then, we hid. We didn't even wear our medals. Men wore them, but not women. Men were victors, heroes, wooers. The war was theirs, but we were looked at with quite different eyes. Quite different. And I'll tell you, they robbed us of victory. They quietly exchanged it for ordinary women's happiness. Men didn't share the victory with us. It was painful and incomprehensible because at the front, men treated us marvelously well. They always protected us. I've never encountered such an attitude towards women in peaceful life. When we retreated, we'd lie down to rest in the bare ground. They stayed in their army shirts and gave us their overcoats. The girls, they need to be covered. They'd find a piece of cod and wool or a bandage somewhere. Take it, you might need it. They'd share a little last rusk. We saw and knew nothing but kindness and warmth during the war. And after the war? I'm silent. Silent. What keeps us from remembering the unbearableness of the memories? Deep cuts. <laughs> deep, deep cuts. I like that one because that was kind of talks a little bit about the the way in which women for a, actually quite a long time after the war were not really included in official history. No, even in like a lot of Soviet films after the war, it's not usually showing the women that were, you know, also victorious. Like mm. they're saying, not, you know, out there strutting with their medals and whatnot. But also this like idea of just feeling broken and like you can't reintegrate back into society afterwards. I mean, basic things like getting a job after. Like imagine that. That's that's just crazy. On this front, uh, both Svetlana Alexeyevich and Rambo First Blood can agree. <laughs> it's hard to be a veteran. <laughs> sad, yes, sir. <laughs> but yes, this is a sad book. This is. I thought that the book we're going to read in a couple weeks, um, One Soldier's War, was going to be the saddest thing we'd read in a long time on this podcast. But um, no, this one blew me out of the water. It was. Take that, Cameron. So much sadder. My book wins. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately my book wins on that front uh you get you get the award i don't know what the award is but you get it you get it my friend the sad sad boy award <laughs> i drank to your award <laughs> well cameron before we totally wrap up at a scale from one to yeltsin how drunk are you i am a seven or an eight uh, the very high ABV beer plus almost this entire bottle mm. of sake has really done mm-hmm. a number. So, yeah, I'm maudlin drunk now about World War II. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, as one does. As one does, as I do weekly. Uh, how about you? How, <laughs> where are you on the scale? Oh, I'm, you know, I, I've gone somehow below sober, <laughs> just sad sober. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. So, that's yeah, you can know. only be expected. <laughs> yeah, I really should have just pushed. I really should have powered through and had a drink, anyways. You might be at the exact same level of sober, regardless of drink, regardless of your drinking or not, with this book. That's possible. That's possible. Well, well, well. Uh, what are we well. reading next week, Matt? To perhaps get our minds off this very sad subject. Well, next week. It, it won't be as sad, I don't think. Oh, I sure hope not. Uh, we're going to be reading part three of Anna Karenina for our Summer of Anna Karenina series, so stay tuned. That many chapters but Levin mowing wheat cannot be sad. We can only be happy. It's truly the high point of the book, but we'll talk about it next <laughs> week. Before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons, Jeff, Janice, Anne, Emily, Jesse, Madeline, Alex, Daniel, Irini, Paige, Darren, Larkin, Lou, Gary, Daniel, Jack, Alex, and Roland. Podcasting isn't free, and grad school doesn't pay very well, 
So if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon.